Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. It's been another big week of CPU and GPU testing around here. That tends to be the case when a bunch of companies launch products at the same time. We've still got a ton of content coming up over the next few weeks on some hotly requested topics, so stay tuned for that. But for now, well, let's look at some new stories. First up, I wanted to take a brief look at the CPU market and see how prices for parts are stacking up after the launch of AMD's third gen Ryzen series. It's also good we're running this segment on Friday and not earlier this week because that's where a number of CPUs got discounted for Amazon's Prime Day. So I think we're seeing, well, well at least what we're seeing today is going to be more representative of how these CPUs will be priced over the coming weeks. What I'm happy to see is that Ryzen 3000 series CPUs are selling at the MSRP. We've seen from several Intel launches in the past that low supply and high demand can push up the pricing on parts like the Core i5-8400 or Core i9-9900K, but that isn't happening with these Ryzen chips. A quick browse on Amazon shows all parts selling at their MSRP, although right now the 3900X is out of stock with a similar story at Newegg. For older Ryzen parts, the Ryzen 7 2700X did briefly drop to $200, before the last week has remained steady at $250. Meanwhile, the Ryzen 7 2700 is $200 at several retailers and dropped briefly to $150 at Newegg. These prices are basically pitting AMD's second gen 8 core chips against third gen 6 core CPUs, which makes them decent options for productivity, but perhaps not quite as good as third gen for gaming. The Ryzen 5 2600 is available for around $125 US dollars, which is a great price for a 6-core CPU, as is the Ryzen 5 1600 for just $105. Both of these options will be really suitable for budget builders that just want to jump on the AIM4 platform now and give themselves an upgrade path to 3rd gen Ryzen when they can afford it, or perhaps even future CPUs. We've only seen these low prices for the past week or so, and while they won't give the same performance as 3rd gen, they're still a great option at below $150. On the Intel front, the Core i9-9900KF has been on sale at Newegg for $420, but by the time this video goes live, I think that sale will have just finished, so yeah, sad times if you wanted Intel's 8-core CPU with no iGPU. However, it was only last week that we saw the CPU hit $440 in a brief sale, so who knows, maybe it will drop in price again. The other big one to look out for right now is the Core i5-9400F, which to be fair has been sitting around $150 for a while now at some retailers, but considering the standard list price is more like $180, it'll be an interesting battle between it and some of the Ryzen parts. The Core i5-9600KF has dropped down to $230 from its standard $260 price in the last few days at Amazon and Newegg as well, although again, that sale might be ending soon. Meanwhile, the non-F models don't seem to be getting much love on the price drop front. In general, I think it's safe to say we're in a great time for buying CPUs and PC building with prices like this. Hopefully we do see more competition and price drops as the year goes on. I definitely think that will be the case. At this week's Fortune Brainstorm Tech Conference, Intel CEO Robert Swan has talked more openly about the reasons behind the company's struggles with delivering 10 nanometers on time. As many analysts have expected and known about for some time, Swan admits that Intel being overly aggressive with their design for 10 nanometer led to delays and issues. Swan is quoted as saying the delay was somewhat a function of what we've been able to do in the past, which in essence was defying the odds. At a time when it was getting harder and harder, we set a more and more aggressive goal. From that, it just took us longer. He also said that Intel prioritized performance at a time when predictability was really important. Specifically, Swan said that the end goal for 10 nanometer ended up being a 2.7 times improvement to transistor density over last gen 14 nanometer nodes, which was a significant step above Intel's usual 2.0 times target over two years. Having faced lengthy delays with this sort of goal, Intel is getting back to 2.0x scaling with their 7 nanometer parts, which Swan confirmed will be available in two years. In their belief, there is lots of road left in Moore's law, but as well, Intel are looking at new ways to package chips for additional gains some of that tech we've already seen bits of. There are still huge question marks over how 10 nanometer will perform in its final iteration. The current theory is that there will be some gains for low power processors for things like laptops and so on, but it seems that Intel might not be able to clock these parts as high as with 14 nanometer, which won't make 10 nanometer all that well suited to high performance chips for desktop users. Still, 10 nanometer CPUs in some form will definitely be available later this year, so yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they bring. This next story is very straightforward. 
Tweak Town asked Nvidia's Jeff Fisher at the launch event for their company's new GeForce Super graphics cards whether there would be a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti Super. The answer was there would not be, so the 2080 Ti Super does not exist. And this does make sense. Nvidia already sells the Titan RTX as a super expensive higher tier version of the 2080 Ti, with the 2080 Ti sitting at 4,352 CUDA cores and the Titan RTX at 4,608. There wouldn't have been a lot of room to move for the 2080 Ti Super other than maybe offering the Titan RTX core with 12 gigabytes of GDDR6 instead of 24 gigabytes. There were some rumors suggesting a super skew for the 2080 Ti RM production, but clearly this won't have into an actual product because we seem to have an official word from NVIDIA on this matter. For some reason, once again, stories of motherboard vendors enabling PCIe 4.0 on older AM4 400 series motherboards are doing the rounds. While it does seem that some currently available BIOS versions for boards such as the Tough B450 Pro Gaming from ASUS do have PCIe 4.0 enabled, this is not officially supported by AMD and will be blocked with future BIOS and AGISA revisions. So people with these boards will soon be stuck in a situation where they'll have to choose between the latest optimizations for Ryzen processors and PCIe 4.0 compatibility. AMD's official position remains that PCIe 4.0 is exclusive Exclusive to X570 boards as they cannot guarantee the 400 series boards will have the required signal reliability for PCIe 4.0 to function correctly. Over time, we expect that these motherboards will have PCIe 4.0 disabled with the latest BIOS, so it's nothing to get excited about and certainly we'd choose the latest AGISA versions over PCIe 4.0 for most people. Toshiba Memory is getting rebranded with a new name of Kioxia at the start of October. Yep, a brand that has a fair bit of traction in the memory market will be completely erased and replaced with some random name that no one has ever heard of. Toshiba do say the new name is a combination of the Japanese word for memory, which I think is pronounced kioksu, and the Greek word for value, which is axia, but still to me it doesn't seem like a great name. So Kioxia is the new brand name for the second largest NAND manufacturer in the world. There are also plans for an IPO in the works after the company was sold to Bain Capital in 2017 for a massive $18 billion. Toshiba Memory are also still recovering from a significant power outage that affected a huge amount of NAND production that we covered in News Corner not that long ago. Igor from Igor's Lab has managed to get a Radeon RX 5700 XT running at 2.2 GHz through an SPPT mod. SPPT is short for Soft Power Play Table, and using it is kind of an interesting way to overclock. Basically, AMD's driver reads a power play table from the BIOS of the GPU and writes that into the Windows registry to form a soft power play table. From there, you can go in and modify the SPPT to raise power limits, which lead to higher clocks. Of course, for this sort of mod, you should have a highly capable cooling solution like a liquid cooling block so that you don't run into any thermal problems when you do raise that power limit. Igor played around with a plus 95% power limit on the RX 5700 XT, as well as a high core overclock. Although despite being listed as plus 95%, it didn't actually double power consumption. Instead, there was only a small gain to around 250 watts under load, up from 215 watts. And in his Shadow of the Tomb Raider benchmark, this was enough to take the RX 5700 XT from performing below an RTX 2070 Super to performing near the level of the RTX 2080 Founders Edition stock. This sort of overclocking, yeah, won't be for the faint-hearted, but it just goes to show how much is still left in the RX 5700 XT if you have the cooling capacity. Final topic of this week, Intel has been secretly offering a super high-performance version of their Xeon Platinum server processors, but it hasn't been visible in Intel's Arc unless you know the specific model number and you search for it. Officially, the highest part Intel lists is the Xeon Platinum 8280, a Cascade Lake server chip with 28 cores, a base frequency of 2.7 GHz, and a maximum turbo clock of 4.0 gigahertz. It is a 205 watt TDP and retails for a touch over 10,000 US dollars unless you need the models with higher memory support which cost even more. However, as it turns out there is a higher model available, the Xeon Platinum 8284. It provides a 300 megahertz increase to the base clock and in doing so raises the TDP to 240 watts. However, for the privilege of this small clock speed increase, you'd be slugged for at least a 1k unit price of $15,460. So yeah, it costs roughly $5,500 for that frequency pump. Uh, given the chip is not in ARC unless you know the exact model number, this is typically going to be available only to select customers, perhaps even as a custom order. 
The pricing might also sound ridiculous, and in some ways it is, but server customers can be willing to pay enormous prices for small performance improvements depending on their setup and needs. That's it for this week's News Corner. As always, you can subscribe for more News Corner episodes every week. Consider supporting us on Patreon, like we mentioned at the end of basically every video. I guess you can hit the like button too if you enjoyed it as well. That's always a nice thing to do. I'll catch you in the next one.